Be careful of what you ask. Oh, I'm boy. I'm going answer you're looking for. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the special holiday edition of the Frankie Slauson Show right here on YouTube.com. And uh, I, I wanted to do this during, around the holidays because I figure it's kind of a nice way to, you know, to spend the Christmas time. If, you, if you're if you bored and you have nothing else to do and you want to listen to uh, uh, this my show anyway, I got... Uh, I got a guy who is, who is known for well, basically kind of living, making his dad, his making his memory, uh, keeping it alive. And and his father's name is uh, J. P. Richardson. And if you don't know that name, you would know the Big Bopper. And I got with me right now J. P. Richardson Jr. I believe, or senior. Well, or, uh, or third, close enough, but. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, we have different first names, but I'm, I've been referred to as a lot worse than Junior, so or we'll I just go call, along with that. I just call you Big Bopper Junior, how about <laughs> Well, they do that, too. Uh, <laughs> you know, affectionately refer to me, you know, when we're out on the road, that's that's me. Uh, kind of like when Dad was on the road, he was the Bopper, and when he was home, he was J.P., and same same thing. You know, that that's just when you're on the road, and... Uh, in character, getting that persona, you know, to do the music and sure. shenan- shenanigans and kind of thing <laughs> like that, yeah. And, we, and and I'll just, I want to say something else. I, I hope people aren't just listening to this because they're bored. <laughs> I, I hope, yeah, I hope they want to hear it. And <laughs> yeah, because... Uh, maybe, maybe they're really missing something really good just to listen on. <laughs> well, uh, I, I kind of did a little research uh, on you a little bit uh, while I was waiting for us to do the interview uh, over the last now course of the week. you scare me now. Oh, boy. I I, uh, I heard an interview that you did earlier this year for a radio station out of Wisconsin, I believe it was anyway. A guy named Nathan interviewed you, and uh, I learned a lot about you in in uh, in that interview, and I learned a lot about your dad. But I, I figure I want to have you on anyway because uh, you know I I know most people anyway know about your dad being like you know the one hit wonder, so to speak. Yeah. You know, and and that's pretty much all they know. But I know for a fact, and, and you know for a fact, that there's so much more to your father, and, and I mean, it, it's a, a, unbelievable, you know? Well, quite honestly, there's very few people that can hold a candle uh, to my father as far as uh, his innovative thinking and the things he was doing. You know, people knew him for Chantilly Lace, obviously, but, but because once Chantilly Lace hit, back then in those days, uh, when you were on the road, and of course you, you always had... Uh, several stars because they just wanted to hear the, the hit songs it's not like today yeah you go see one band or maybe a little opening band and it, you know they just wanted to hear the hit stuff <laughs> yeah a lot of people don't know that dad wrote george jones first number one record white lightning which launched his career another uh song called running bear mm-hmm. which was a uh, number one song twice by two different artists in the 60s uh, first, Mr. Johnny Preston, and then uh, Sonny James. Uh-huh. Um, you know, people don't realize that he was a country artist before he did the Chantilly Lace Big Bopper thing. He was known as Jape Richardson, uh-huh. and uh, was with Mercury Records, already signed as a country artist. And then when he recorded Chantilly Lace and sent that to Mercury, they sent it to Mercury. Mercury turned him down. They wanted to keep him as the country artist. And uh, after a few weeks down here in uh, Texas and this part of the country, south southeast Texas, uh, they sold several thousand copies pretty quick. Uh-huh. And, and uh, Mercury, uh, I have the telegram where Mercury said, oh, maybe we made a mistake and the big bopper really does know what we like. <laughs> and uh, as they say, the rest is history. But, uh, but being you brought it up, you know, my dad has set the world's record in continuous broadcast on radio. Yep. Uh, when he got out of the service in 57, he wanted everybody to know he was back. He was a DJ um, since high school. He'd been working at the station anyway uh, since high school. And um, he did a 122-hour uh, and eight-minute show in the in the front of a theater. That's a little over five days. Yeah, I'd uh, say. Before, wow. yeah, before, you, before you go to counting your fingers there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, he did it in the front of a movie theater in Beaumont, Texas, yeah. uh, so people could come by day or night and see that, you know, he wasn't hiding in a back room or anything, he, you know, people coming by all hours of the evening and daytime just just to see him, you know, yeah. watch him. Um, Dad's in five different uh, uh, halls of fame, five different genres, 
He's in the Texas Country Music Hall of Fame. He's in the Texas uh, uh, Radio Hall of Fame. He's in the Iowa Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Yep. He's he's in the National Rockabilly Hall of Fame uh, in Jackson, Tennessee, and he's in the what they call the uh, uh, Songwriters Walk of uh, Fame in Nashville, Tennessee. It must make you very and, must make you very proud just to know all that stuff, you know. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, what, we didn't even bring up, you know, he's credited with the world's first music videos. He did the world's first three music videos and he coined the phrase. And and nobody, you know, um, you know, Dad hadn't had a movie. No. And I think a lot of that, you know, has to do with that. You know, even though, even though the two movies were very entertaining about Buddy and Richie, uh-huh. you know, you know, I call it Hollywood. You know, yeah, more you or know, less. You, 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 yeah, you got to sell tickets. And that's understandable, but pretty much, you know, I, I tell these guys, and we're and we're still talking to people today, uh, a group of people. Um, you know, Dad uh, had uh, in such a short period of time, and and, and uh, I don't know that you'll find another individual that are in those five, you know, five different uh, types of halls of fame, the different genres of music and radio, and you know that kind of thing. So yeah, in that in that regard, I'm very proud of him. Um, um, like I say, I, I I just don't know what else he could have done. He was right on the verge, and you know he had just shot these music videos two months before his death. Um, <laughs> That's and incredible. So there's no telling. Yeah, I mean there's no telling. I you know I say you'd have probably had Bopper Vision twenty years before MTV had Dad lived. <laughs> you know I mean yeah I mean yeah I mean that's I mean he was really on to it. You know he was he 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 he, he, he was just one of those innovators. You know he. He, he, he could see where, you know, where it needed to go. And I, I tell people that uh, I can only imagine, you know, I know where he shot this thing. And with a couple of cameras, they did it at, an, at a club in Beaumont, Texas, uh, after hours, and uh, like a dinner club. And, you know, they had kind of like where Ricky Ricardo would play. Oh, sure. Uh, you know, where they have all the different backdrops and different things. And so after hours... Uh, I can imagine Dad talking to his buddies that were running the camera or said, hey, I want you to hang around with me. And I'm going to get up there and I'm going to do this thing. And it's a video. And they're going, you're going to do what? <laughs> you know, like, you know, nobody had ever heard. Yeah. You know? and, but, but, but he had this thing in his head. And um, like I say, just and while we're talking about it, they are uh, here just recently uh, made available on iTunes. We've been holding on to them for years uh, and not releasing them and then uh, decided here just several months ago that we would so anybody that likes to take a look can go to iTunes and check it out but they are the world's first uh, three uh, videos by about three or four years ahead of Ricky Nelson I think previously was was Jeez. credited with, with doing that yeah, yeah. they're not kin- they're not <clears throat> kinescopes you know I mean they're you know, and if you see it you'll you'll see you, you, you know it's obvious. I think when you uh, watch it. I think somebody put the Chantilly Lace music video on YouTube because I've seen it on YouTube before. Well, now there's one of him when he was on Dick Clark. Um, that is what generally runs. Um, it was the one I've seen before. I haven't seen uh, you know because I kind of watch for that because that's something that we obviously want to protect from you know from from that yeah uh and, and unless somebody wants to do some advertising <laughs> you know and help us help us out over here sure uh but but no but the dick clark one um when dad was on dick clark is generally it, it has been the one that's been up there you know for several years i, I think um, but, i think but when... i'm gonna have to now you got me i'm gonna <laughs> have to go get back on the computer and look it up now oh i'm sure you'll be fi- able to find it uh yeah, because uh, that's that's the one that I remember seeing, like uh, when Dick Clark came out with the rock and roll era, which uh, my my parents happened to own the the whole CD set of that, uh, and I remember seeing the the Big Boppers uh, video as advertised for the for the set anyway. Well, that was when he was on the yeah that was shot. See, that was that was what they call a kinescope. Okay, that's where they actually take a camera and you know they have the TV monitors in the studio. And they're shooting him, and they didn't have videotape. No. And so what they do is that they would um, um, uh, would take pictures of the camera. Uh-huh. And I'm sorry, can we take a break right here? Yeah, I can pause. Okay, it. Can I call you right back? I've got a phone call here. I'll, I'll, I'll call you because uh, I, I, I give, got... me, give me ten minutes. Okay. Ten minutes.
And this is the end of part one with uh, Big Bopper Jr. Uh, we'll talk to Big Bopper Jr. A, a recitation uh, that goes in the song. I don't know if you've ever heard it or you've heard someone watching over you. Yeah, yeah. Correct? Yep, yep, yep. Well, at the end of the song, instead of repeating someone watching over you three times, I just do it once. And then we go into the recitation, which is the only things I know about my dad come from stories other folks have told. Of course, I have all his million sellers on my wall, coated in gold. Huh. Through the years past, I've learned to love a man I'll never know or ever see. I just wish I had something more than these secondhand big bopper memories. Huh. I often wonder what inspired him to write a song like Chantilly Lace. When I asked Mom if it was her, she just smiles and gets a faraway look in her face. There's not a night that passes that he doesn't walk through my dreams and have a talk with me. I just wish I had something more than these secondhand big bopper memories. I had a dream long ago, and someday I hope to follow it through, to travel around this world and meet all the people my daddy knew. And my heart could be at rest, and my old mind set free. I just wish I had something more than these secondhand Big Bopper memories. And then we come back in, and I do the last verse of someone watching over you, you know, through its entirety. Well, yeah, that, um, that's, that sounds pretty beautiful anyway. I almost well, got teary oh, it is. <laughs> well, because when I'm on stage, well, you know, there's, there's, a, little, yeah, there's a little more... Uh, emotion and feeling behind it, and me just <laughs> kind of telling it to you. Yeah. But I, you know, the story, like I tell people, you know, I kind of feel like Dad may have left someone watching over you for me, not knowing it. Yeah. Uh, which I believe he is, and I said, in just in the last few years, I wrote something that, you know, <laughs> that, that 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 I wanted to pay tribute to Dad, and uh, and so anyway, uh, basically, yeah. Dad and I co-wrote a song 50 years uh, after his death. You know, <laughs> That's after amazing. his passing. That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. anyway. Yeah, so... But that's my favorite song. Okay. Chantilly Lace, Ch Chantilly Lace and White Lightning are the, are the money makers. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But my favorite song is someone watching over you. So, do you wish that they would have put more of his songs out on the radio? Because he does, he's, ha you know, I mean, I, I've heard the first 19 or 20 songs that he's that he sang. I've, I've heard every one of them on CD and everything. Well, we don't have any others that I'm aware of that he recorded. Now he had, his catalog was about seventy songs. But uh, what I'm talking like the the ones that he performed, like the other ones that other than just uh, oh, someone watched, you know, like his yeah, the but, stuff that he put on album or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Well, back when and some there's some stations that do do that. You know, they play the other stuff. Um, but you know, like I say, back then they just had him pushing Chantilly Lace. You know, Little Red Riding Hood. Yeah. Uh, cracked the top 70 I believe it was or you know it was like number 67 maybe it was 70 something but I think 67 and then uh, Big Bopper's Wedding cracked uh, the top 40 and it was in the 30s somewhere at okay. one point but you know but when he died you know they just they you know they quit playing those things huh. and so they never you know I mean dad has a lot of good stuff but it never you know once you had a hit record like I say, that's what they wanted you to sing, and that's what they pushed. And they didn't want to hear, you know, well, I just wrote a new song here, you know, like you go to the show today. You know, this is yeah. my latest deal. You know, they didn't want, they didn't want, you know, promoters didn't want that. They wanted, you know, the known stuff, you know, because once you'd been on Dick Clark or, you know, uh, any kind of, uh, you know, national uh, broadcast, where kids could see that because back then everything was very regional. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, like people up in, in the East Coast or West Coast thought Dad was uh, African American because of his voice, you know. Oh, and you didn't, yeah, well, I mean, you know, that's kind of what he did, you know. He just, he kind of, you know, with the dialect, uh, the big bopper, um, because really, you know, the black artists were the ones with all the. The, the big records and you know all the good records at the time <laughs> and uh, so dad just kind of you know kind of incorporated that into his big bopper persona and uh, and that's why yeah <laughs> so uh, how, how come there was never a big bopper movie because I was kind of uh, curious about that you know to why there was I, never I wish I knew <laughs> uh, uh, you know we've we've been working on one for over 20 years with several different entities and right now, and there should be it, 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 it just any day now, I could get a phone call that they've completed the script. But I met with uh, 
finally myself, I met with two very big uh, producers, um, one with the Buddy Holly story and one with uh, the uh, Shawshank Redemption uh, here about three months, four months ago uh, out in Santa Barbara. They came to our show and we met with them, my uh, uh, entertainment attorney out in L.A. had set it up, invited him to the show and he knew one of these people and, and just said, hey, come on out and you know, and anyway, he was very kind and, and said, you know, he'd looked at a script someone had written, didn't like it. I uh-huh. said, well, what if we put what if we put together, you know, something else? I said, would you take time to look at it put together something else? Uh, because we didn't do the script. It was written by somebody else. Yeah. And uh, he said, sure. He said, you know, you get it to me. He said, you know, I'd be more than happy, you know, to look at it. And uh, so anyway, that's when... That's when, through my attorney, we hired a writer, and this writer is very familiar with everything and knows that it has to have, like I say, what I call the Hollywood aspect. You know, you got to sell tickets. There's certain certain things that have to be in a movie uh, uh, when you make a movie, and uh, and, and all that. You know, and, and and that was what was good with the talk to have the talk with these people. Sure. Was to find out, you know, what do you want? What are you looking for? And besides, you know, even though he's an interesting person and what he did, and you know, and all the facts are there, you know, you you still need other things in there. Well, and yeah, that's what we hope we're doing. <laughs> uh, nowadays, it's so. I mean, the movie industry is so much different than it used to be back in the day. But you know, you just kind of wonder, like you know, like with the Buddy Holly story. Uh, even though they made a movie about Buddy. But I know they, they said that the, a lot of the facts that they showed in the movie weren't all all true. Like, he never hit nobody or anything like that. You know, like the like the like that one scene where he's hitting the, uh, where, he, where Gary Busey punches the studio recorder guy or whatever. As far as well, I know, that, yeah, as far as I know, Buddy was never a violent person. <laughs> well, who knows that? Yeah. You know, I mean, I mean, I don't, you know, it's just like, you know, uh, and I, uh, I don't know, maybe I talked about that. You know, Buddy had a gun Yeah. that was you know, that was, he brought with him on the plane. Uh, you know, he carried it with him everywhere, and, and so he had it on the plane, and when the plane crashed, they didn't find the gun for a couple of weeks uh, after the snow melted. And uh, according to newspaper reports there, the farmer that found it said he shot it three times to see if it worked. Huh. Uh, so rumors persisted that, you know, there was some foul play involved. And, you know... You don't know that. I don't know that, and I'll tell you why. For one, is that they only autopsied the pilot, um, and it was an acting coroner, not even the regular coroner, which, like I say, is not a, necessarily is not a medical doctor. You know, it could sure. be anybody, pretty much, be a coroner. But uh, the regular coroner was not in town, so what they call the acting coroner uh, did a did a basically a visual autopsy, from what I understand. And, of course, they weren't looking for bullets. Uh, you know, Roger was still tangled up in the wreckage, the pilot. Uh-huh. And so he had, you know, many wounds. And it was obvious that he was deceased. So, there, you know, and there was no reason. They weren't looking for a gun. They didn't know their gun existed at the time. Yeah, I'm sure. Until, and so, so what happened was they, they went out and they told the former, look, uh if there's glass, as a matter of fact, Buddy's glasses sat out there, my dad's watch, some dice, all kind of stuff. And the sheriff went out there and says, hey, you know, the families wrote because Miss Holly had written or someone representing her, uh, uh, I say written or in some form or fashion made contact with the authorities there saying, that, you know, Buddy's glasses were missing and, you know, gun. Uh, whatever, whatever personal effects, uh, you know, that she mentioned or they, her representatives mentioned. And same thing on, with my mother, you know, like, hey, we didn't get his watch, we didn't get his briefcase, we didn't, you know, these certain things, you know, that they, they didn't return. Uh-huh. Well, this wasn't until after everybody had been buried. <laughs> and they never autopsied Dad, Buddy, or Richie. Yeah. They didn't even, they never autopsied him. So this rumor persisted about a gun. So to get back to what you just said about being, uh, you know, an angry type person or a, a violent person, yeah, you know, you, you don't know, 
and and only there's only there were only four people that know really, and maybe only one, maybe the pilot. Yeah, that know what happened that night, and they're not here to tell us. Yeah, that's for sure. Uh, you know, it, so, it, yeah, you, know, you just kind of wonder. What we're left with. Yeah, and, and you know, I've always kind of wondered, you know, just what would life be like if they wouldn't have taken the the plane, if the plane wouldn't have crashed, if they would have just survived, or I mean, like just you know, were able to go to their next uh, destination. And they still would, you know, I mean, obviously they'd be older today, you know, obviously they'd be senior citizens, yeah. but, but just kind of wonder what life would be like if they were, if that day would have happened, you know, if that crash would have happened, you know? Well, I, you know, that's, that's a hard one to answer, you know, cause I'm asked that, you know, I've got three beautiful children, a beautiful seven month old grandbaby, a wonderful wife, yeah. um, and she's beautiful too, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so it's hard for me to answer that question because had my father lived, I wouldn't have the family I have today. Oh, really? Um, well, I mean, why do you no, think? I'm why sure you? I why I you? Why do you think that? Well, well, Dad would have been doing so many things. I'd have been in. Uh, you know, I wasn't involved in the music business until I was in my late thirties. Okay. You know, I'd have I'd have been on. Dad wanted to move to Denver and buy a radio station. Okay. You know, I met my wife in high school. You know, I wouldn't even have been in Beaumont, probably. Huh. So that's what I'm saying. The odds of me meeting my wife would have been so remote. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't have the same. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. Cause I, I guess you, yeah. just know, I, you know, maybe it was all about faith. You don't maybe. think of that. <laughs> no. See, that's what I think of. And, okay. And, I, and, 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 and Dad was taken for a reason. And certainly I wish it wouldn't have happened. But then again... In, in, in another sense, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't have the life, I wouldn't have the people in my life that I love and yeah. and cherish, and uh, you know, so it's it's kind of a between a rock and a hard place for me. <laughs> so, but, but bottom line yeah. is, you know, I'm, I've got a beautiful family yeah. that ninety nine point nine 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 percent. I probably wouldn't have, you know, I wouldn't have even remotely come close to, to, to having or, or meeting meeting my, my wife. Sure. So so, so then uh, what made you decide to uh, start uh, living through your dad's memory, like uh, doing like these little shows that you do? Uh, well, at first I wouldn't call them little shows. Okay. Uh, they're, they're very, <laughs> very nice shows. We do a lot of, you know, we play, uh, you know, all, all the nice venues that... Uh, you know, we've opened for Ronnie Millsap. I've opened for Don McLean, and uh, you know, back when when I first started, most of the uh, the guys, the older guys that were still uh, there, worked with Dick Clark a couple of occasions, and did a two month tour of Europe uh, with Bobby V, Chris Montez, Brian Highland, and the Chiffons, or Judy Mann, the lead singer of the Chiffons. Um, you know, I've, I've I've been to Australia last year. Uh, which is what dad dad was supposed to go to australia in march of 59 uh -huh. but was killed a month before but 52 years later i went oh wow and and i did a month tour down in australia which was really cool but how i got involved was i owned a um, nightclub and one of the gentlemen that was one of my regulars that played there regularly uh was frankie ford huh. who's big hit record was Sea Cruise. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, well, don't you let me take you on a <laughs> Sea Cruise. Cruise. Ooh, wee, yeah, ooh, wee, baby. Yeah, that's him. Well, after hours one night, you know, I the doors and, you know, we we're sitting in there and, and, and as I tell it, we were drinking diet sodas, <laughs> which which could be a lie. Yeah, that could uh, be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it could be. And it was, but it could be. Um, <laughs> that's, that's, that's an honest lie. Uh, hey, that's okay, you know. <laughs> that's as truthful a lie as I can tell. That's fine. <laughs> um, but anyway, we uh, we were playing pool, and, you know, I, I don't know if Frankie went over and played or the jukebox just, you know, randomly played stuff from time to time or how it worked, but Dad came on, and I just started singing along to it. And, you know, we're talking about 3 or 4 in the morning probably. Oh, you know, sure. we'd stay there till daylight when they come in. And uh, and it was just me, Frankie, and his manager. And he asked me, he said, man, you ought to do something with that. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you sound like him. You look like your dad. You ought to, you know, you ought to 
you ought to do something, you know, in his memory. And, you know, I kind of thought he was off his rocker, you know, a little bit. <laughs> a little drunk, baby, I, or something. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I'd never, I owned the club, I owned my own club. I brought in many acts, and um, I'd, I'd never gotten on stage and, and, and sung a song. You know, I was nervous to get up there to introduce acts. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, well, I, it, it was a tough thing because of who my father was for me. Uh, when, when he asked me to do what he did, he called me um, one summer, and it was after I'd closed the club. A couple of years later, he called me, and this was in, like, 95. And he said, hey, you got this thing, and we'd like you to come do a couple songs, and, you know, it's a big it's a big thing. Fabian's hosting it, and it's 20 acts on the deal, and everybody just does two or three songs, you know, they're what they're most known for, and like you to come out and do it. And I said, well, Ken, and that's Frankie's manager, I said, I, um, you know, I, I'm, I really, I've never done that. And I said, and I, you know, I've never even sung to just music, you know, with, to my, my sure. father's songs. I'd only, I'd only sung along with records. <laughs> and uh, I had a good friend that, down in Orlando, Florida that owned a, uh, uh, and still does, a recording studio where I recorded my uh, album or CD. Sure. And I called him. And, and just said, look, this is what Frankie wants me to do and Ken wants me to do. And, um, you know, would you please put these two songs down on, on tape? Where I can, and I'll fly down there and uh, you tell me, that, you know, because he's obviously a musician himself and been in the recording business. Uh, I said, you be honest with me. And it was a quote. I said, and, and, and if I suck, you tell me. <laughs> Sure. I mean, that's what I told him. And I said, and if I do, I said, well, just go fishing. <laughs> and I was serious. I, you yeah. know, I love freshwater fishing, and sure. I, you know, I've never been to Florida. And I, I thought, I can't lose. You know? <laughs> it's a win-win. <laughs> it's a win-win situation. Yeah, I'm getting out of the house for three or four days, sure. and I'm going to go fishing at the worst. <laughs> and uh, anyway, I went down there, and he, he plugged it in. We went straight to the studio after he picked me up from the airport. He plugged in Chantilly Lace. I sang about a verse and a half, and he hit a button and stopped it. And I got to thinking, boy, I hope he's got a pocket full of purple worms, you know, <laughs> if we're going bass fishing. <laughs> and uh, he looked at me, and and then what's funny, I'd met him. His name's Mike Franklin. Okay. I'd met him at the surf ballroom cool. uh, in, in, the, in the late 80s. Oh, I'd wow. met him there when I met Maria Holly and the Valens family. Jeez. His band was backing everybody. And so, you know, that's already one of those weird kind of strange how they how that happened. <laughs> and this is eight years later or so that I asked him to do this. And he looks at me and he says, you can do this like a puzzle. Like, yeah, I've known you for eight years. And how come I didn't know you could do this? <laughs> <laughs> so, and I'm thinking, well, you know, I'm 38 years old. And I didn't know I could do this. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Magic. Uh, well, you know, so anyway, he, he, I, he made, you know, I had this tape with the two songs, White Lightning and Chantilly Lace. I came home, and um, and well, originally what I told Ken, for back up a little bit, back in 95, when Ken had, had, had called me and asked me, and I told him, no, I couldn't, uh, you know, I didn't know, I'd never done it. I said, but I'll work on it, and I'll be ready next year. Well, I'd completely forgotten about that. Uh -huh. So about nine months later, I get a phone call, ten months later. Hey, Jay, it's Ken. Hey, what's up, Ken? How you doing? Oh, good. I said, he said, I've got your tickets. <laughs> and, and and about the time I'm going, I'm thinking, you know, and fixing to open my mouth and go, what tickets? It dawned on me what I told him, you know, about nine months earlier. And I had done nothing. Yeah. I had not rehearsed. I had not, you know, I just figured that was going. That was the end of it. <laughs> and he had bought my wife and I plane tickets, and this was a two-day golf tournament, you know, full of celebrities. and Sure. Uh, you know, uh, just just a nice thing. Well, anyway, I had to call Mike real quick, and that's when I went down in Mike. We did all that, and I came home, and for two months, I played the little cassette um, uh, with my my son. Uh, it was probably two or three years old at the time, and we took we took Mama's uh, candles off of the mantle and we and used them as microphones, uh -huh. and and that's uh, that's how I learned to. 
you know, how to sing, uh, really well, to sing huh? along to the music. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that, 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 yeah, that was it. That's how it started. That was your singing uh, lessons, huh? <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> that was it. Uh, and I can tell you, when I went out to uh, this place, um, I, I didn't. Uh, I could. I could. Uh, I could. I, I could put a uh, a mouthful of water. I could take a bottle and fill my mouth full of water and yep. blow it out, and nothing would come out. I was so dry. <laughs> I was so nervous, and you don't know what your body does. You know, I had no idea I was I was going to be like that. Sure. And and um, but we we got through it. Even even I told a little funny or two, just on stage, just being me, uh, <laughs> not thinking about it. And uh, over four thousand people, standing room only. They had they had chairs because it was just gone crazy. Uh, and not because of me, but because of the event. Um, so I don't want to make it sound like because I was there, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> uh, which is probably why. But no, I don't know. <laughs> well, I'll treat you like royalty. But, but it, but you know, it was a huge thing to go from your living room with a candle to going on stage in front of over four thousand people. Were you nervous at uh, all? I've been doing that. I I couldn't. I, I I didn't talk to anybody all day long. Okay. Uh, and like I said, I was so dry. My my mouth was so dry. Just I just you know I was freaking out. And <laughs> and and I'm gonna tell you when I was being introduced, they kept me for the second half of the show. And uh, they did like ten acts, and then you know took a little intermission and did the other ten acts. When they introduced me, and he said a very bunch you know a bunch of nice things, and and, and this first time out, you know, and give him a big hand. Well, when you was walking to the stage, you walk upstairs to the right to come up, on, you know, on the back of the stage, yeah. back side kind of. Sure. And to my left was an exit door. Oh. And it you know, had an exit sign over it. And I looked at that exit sign real hard. And I really did come very close uh, to, walk to walking out, out huh? that door. Oh, jeez. And, yeah, but what I might might be losing here if my phone's going dead but what um I, I just decided you know I, all these times i told my children you know you preach these things to your kids that you know you, and you, you're not gonna fail unless you try and you don't know until you, you know sure and at that time i'm going man i wish i hadn't told them all that stuff you know <laughs> <laughs> but it turned out to be successful so, anyway for you you know oh no that's what i'm saying it was the best thing that's happened in my life as far as you know career wise and um, you know, and, in, and and being able to keep Dad's music alive, and and still people, you know, we we play sold out places all over, and people can go to winterdanceparty.com. That's wh who I work with most of the time. Okay. Um, and then bigbopper.com. Sure. Uh, we're in the middle of putting all that together because I do, you know, uh, uh, solo stuff. Well, that's where but I found you. That's where I, I found you and sent an email to you through that website. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, that's. Well, we also, if you check out winterdanceparty.com, okay. our schedule's up there, and um, we're fixing to get real busy. You know, we always do January and February, March. Sure. Uh, from New Year's Eve on, that's because when Dad and them were doing it, that's how this got started 13 years ago, 14 oh. years ago, was retracing the uh, path that Dad and them had traveled. Oh, okay. And <laughs> that's how it got started. And that was the name of the, what they did was the yep, Winter Dance yep. Party. Oh, yeah. So... Anybody looking like they'll catch a good show, good family show, good old rock and roll music, and uh, you know it, it, it's uh, these guys that I work with. This guys, I tell people, this isn't something they do. This is what they do. Sure. You know our sax, our saxophone players won two Grammy awards. Our drummer's been nominated. Matter of fact, we we just lost a guitar player here earlier this year that who is now uh, the lead guitar player for Dwight Yoakam. Oh wow. Uh, yeah, and Dwight, <laughs> oh yeah, he's rocking, man. Uh, Eugene, <laughs> Eugene Yarmello. Okay. But uh, anyway, he just I just thought of that he called me earlier. They're going to be in Houston tomorrow, and I'm going to go see him. Wow. Um, but he played, you know, he's played with us for many years. Um, but he couldn't turn down Dwight Yoke. No, you know. no, you couldn't. No. <laughs> no. That'd be a big I'd mistake. Change, I'd change my name if I had to. Dwight <laughs> called. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell you what, man, I, I appreciate you taking the time uh, to let me interview you. I mean, I we have learned a lot more than 
than we than most of us have known about your dad and also about yourself. It'd be cool one day if you came up to my area, which is like northern Minnesota, uh, and we did a show. <laughs> I would love to see we you. Can this is part one, so we can always do part two of this interview. Oh yeah, and and check the website. But we used to go to Duluth and then a couple of Grand something, not Grand, Grand Rapids. Not Grand, Grand Rapids, maybe? Grand Forks. Grand, okay, okay. That, yeah, I'm two is hours. Is that up there? Yeah, I'm two hours away from Grand Forks. Isn't that up there? But, yeah, we're in Minnesota. You know, we do Eau Claire, uh, of course, Green Bay. We're all through Wisconsin, Minnesota. We're, well, I know we got some dates in South Dakota and North Dakota okay. coming up. I'll have to uh, look. I'll have to look up the schedule because if you are, if you do do something in uh, North Dakota or something, yeah, I would love to check it out because and, and meet you and everything. Well, me, yeah, check it out because I, I I hadn't looked at the schedule. You know, the hard, uh, hard enough to you know I just get on the plane and they pick me up. And yeah, they, you know we travel <laughs> and wherever they stop, I start singing. You know, sure. Um, but it's um, um, yeah on the Winter Dance Party uh, site you can find all that out and uh, certainly give me a call and all uh, right. We'll, we'll, we'll take care of you. Hey, why not? Yeah, you, yeah. You didn't. I promise you. Anybody else that want to come? You know, they, they, it, it's really. A, it's just a fun show. Uh, it's it's taken. You know, the guys take it very serious what they do. Sure. But you wouldn't know it by by what you see on stage. You know, uh-huh. It's all live. You know, a lot of tribute shows. These two guys I work with, John Mueller and Ray Anthony, are endorsed by the families. The only two guys endorsed by the families to do this. Um. And um, sounds like a fun time, oh, anyway. Oh, well, I guess his, uh, <laughs> I guess his uh, phone died. Well, anyway, uh, I appreciate uh, you uh, getting a chance to, uh, uh, aka the Big Bopper Junior. And uh, yeah, it uh, was a, a, pr- a privilege, anyway, to uh, to talk to him. And uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this interview. And I'm Frankie Slauson, and we'll see you guys on the next one. Uh, got a big uh, interview with a comic coming up, and you might know this guy, or you might not. But uh, if you have, if you saw him on Last Comic Standing a few years ago, uh, he was one of the guys who uh, who uh, made it, I think, to the semifinals, I believe, or the finals. Uh, I'm not going to say who it is, but if you have an idea, I, I announced it on Facebook anyway. But now it's already Christmas, so uh, that was a few days ago. But anyway. Just want to say thanks to J.P. Richardson uh, for letting us do this interview. Uh, any of you big bopper fans out there, I hope this answers a lot of your questions. If you ever had a, you know, if you ever wondering what uh, his life or the big bopper's life was like, and uh, yeah, uh, and if you have any, uh, if there's anybody that you know that's in, a, in the entertainment business uh, that uh, uh, you know w- would like to do an interview or somebody you think I should. Uh, Try to find or whatever. Let me know either via Facebook or let me know here on YouTube, and uh, I'll see what I can do to get them uh, get uh, to, to do an interview. Anyway, Frank Slauson and uh, Merry Christmas, and uh, we'll see you in the next one. Bye.